two, I am my own after-school special. Learning to love the skin I'm in. Think back to yourself as a preteen. Puberty hasn't hit yet, but it's starting to peek around the corner, so you're all kinds of awkward. Braces, training bras that are flat fabric on an even flatter chest, hairy legs, weird growth spurts that leave some parts of your body longer than they should be and others shorter. Nothing about you is proportionate. Nothing is cute. These awkward years smacked the shit out of me. I hated my quarter white, quarter black, half Puerto Rican, and all frizz hair. And my boobs weren't even boobs; they were just big nipples. All the girls I knew at school were starting to wear bras, but when I asked my mom to take me shopping for one, she, old lady of complete and total bluntness, just looked me up and down and asked, "What for?" By the end of elementary school, my acting career had totally dried up. At that age, you're too old to play a cute kid, too young to play a hot teenager, and basically no one wants you. Everything is made even weirder by the fact that you know so many people. I'd go in and audition for the same casting directors who'd once gushed over me as a five-year-old, and I could practically see them grimace like, "Woof! It's unfortunate how this one turned out." I was still giving it a shot, though. And taking vocal lessons to try and keep myself good and ready should that big break suddenly materialize. My teacher was an old standard singer, and she taught me Billy Holiday jazz tunes and classic Broadway numbers. They were huge songs with tons of runs and show-stopping high notes, but way too big for a kid, which is why I developed vocal nodules at the age of ten. I'd been overexerting myself and basically screaming to hit these notes. And the result was that I had to go on serious vocal rest and fire my singing teacher. I had a complete sobbing breakdown in the car upon hearing the news. I thought my voice was going to be gone forever. I'm never going to sing again. Shh, Naya. Shh, my mom said, trying both to calm me down and keep me quiet. It also didn't help that I was a big recess screamer, yelling bloody murder for no good reason as I ran around the playground. For the next several weeks, I had to avoid talking as much as possible, and would catch myself during heated games of handball, when I'd score and turn around triumphantly, ready to talk some shit, only to remember my vocal rest and realize that shit talking isn't nearly as impressive when you have to whisper it. It also didn't help that my parents' marriage was still rocky. Just the year before, my dad had had an affair while my mom was pregnant with my sister. She kicked him out, and I remember going to visit him at his apartment, which was your stereotypical sad dad bachelor pad, dirty beige carpet that no amount of shampooing can clean, a futon as a bed, and just enough dishware to heat up a burrito. I was like, "Dad, this is gross. You need to go home." Meanwhile, my mom and her pregnancy hormones weren't faring much better. She was a devotee of the Scorn Lady playlist. Always crying in her room to some Anita Baker or Tony Braxton, Mom. I said, "Talk to Dad." The next time I saw my dad, I said, "Dad, talk to Mom." Finally, they hired a babysitter to watch my brother and me. And when we came home, they were sitting together at the kitchen table. Mom turned to us and said, "Your father's moving back in." Woohoo! Shortly thereafter, Dad got a new job, and we moved out of our cute but tiny house into a big new one. I got my own room with one of those amazing window seats where the cushion lifts up so that you can hide or just store stuff in there, and I got to pick out a decorating scheme, pink and white bitches. But a new house didn't solve the family problems. Far from it. I just felt anxious all the time. I missed working and the sense of routine and purpose that came with it. I also just straight up loved acting. And although a part of me knew that the reasons I wasn't getting roles were out of my control, a bigger part of me took it as a sign that there was something wrong with me. I felt lost and didn't know what to do with myself. I went into junior high feeling like a loser and a has been. I didn't want to come home after school and watch TV. I wanted to be on TV. One day, I just decided to see how long I could go without eating. I never thought I was fat. If anything, my lack of boobs and scrawny legs told me that I was actually too skinny. 
but being extra OCD about food soon became my thing. It gave me something to think about all day, and it was a secret that I could obsess over without anyone else knowing about it. I just avoided food at all costs. If my mom had packed a lunch for me, I'd either trash it or find some excuse to give it away. If she'd given me money to buy my lunch, I just didn't use it and would save it for the weekends. My eating habits, or total lack thereof, didn't really stand out at school since it seemed like everyone I sat with at lunch was also on her own weird food trip. My best friend Madison was able to convince her mom to buy her Slim Fast bars, and there were other girls in my grade who cranked through a six-pack of Diet Coke in a day, all while nibbling on the same bag of pretzels. In my own sick and twisted way, I'd look at those girls who were sort of dieting and feel superior. Because you want to know how to really lose weight? Just don't eat anything. Ever. All through my years of working and auditions, no one had ever called me chubby, so my budding anorexia had nothing to do with work. I just hated everything about myself. My mom worried that I'd catch a cold when I left for school in the morning in California because my hair was still wet and dripping with gel in a desperate attempt to keep it from curling itself into a mushroom cloud. I also had a mole on my chin that made me feel like a haggard old witch, and I got teased nonstop about it. Naya's so gross with that mole on her chin, I wonder if hair grows out of it, people would say loudly enough for me to hear. I knew that I wasn't one of the prettiest or the most popular girls in school. I wasn't a total outcast. All the popular kids gathered in the quad at lunch or between classes, and I could hang out there too if I wanted, but I knew I wasn't going to win the crown at any school dances. I couldn't work my way into being the prettiest girl in school, but my level of popularity seemed like something that I could control, so soon I was splitting my time between not eating and trying to up my social status. Every day I'd scheme on it. I'd come home from school, do my homework, bluff my way through dinner, and then sit down to decompress and pick apart my day. I had this blue spiral-bound notebook that I'd gotten from the Ross Dress for Less discount department store. The cover had a moon on it with journal printed across the front in silver script. In it, I'd write things like, Dear Diary, Today sucked. This is why. 1. My outfit wasn't on point. My t-shirt was too big and didn't fit right. My shoes looked dirty, and my mom still won't let me stuff the tongues with socks. 2. My hair looked wet in the morning but was a frizz fest by the time I got to geography. Don't use bedhead after party anymore. Go back to pink oil moisturizer. It's supposed to last all day. Three, Cindy's mad at me because I can't spend the night this weekend. Hopefully she'll still let me borrow her Chronic 2 album. Mom won't let me buy it, and I love that song, Can't Make a Ho a Housewife. Four, why don't I have a pager? Everyone else has a pager. I must get a pager. Five, study for math tests. Mr. Johnson announces grades when he hands papers back, and now everyone knows I got a D. Six, eat fewer crackers. Today I had five. Four tomorrow, max. Seven, talk to everyone in the quad, even if I don't really like them. Eight, get more butterfly clips. Tomorrow will be better. XO, Naya. I'd emerge from a good journaling session with a clear sense of purpose and a list of demands that usually seemed completely unreasonable and out of left field to my parents. Dad, I'd scream as I emerged from my bedroom, can you take me to get a yellow shirt? I need a yellow shirt. Nine times out of ten, they'd flat out refuse, so I'd head back to the journal to figure out a plan B. The junior high I went to made us wear uniforms, so I didn't have much to work with in the wardrobe department. But all the finesse and signifiers of your clique was in how you styled it. My style icon was Brittany, the coolest girl in school. Our uniforms were made up of a rather dumpy pair of khaki shorts that came down almost to our kneecaps and a giant thick white cotton polo or t-shirt with sleeves that hung down to our elbows. Brittany, however, was totally unrestrained by these two horrible articles of clothing. She would take the t-shirt and roll the sleeves all the way up to her shoulders, then tie them together across the back with a piece of gift-wrapping ribbon, even curling the ends so they hung down between her shoulder blades in spirals. 
Then she'd take her shorts and roll them up so high that you could practically see her underwear. Really, it looked like she was wearing a giant diaper and had just taken a shit in her pants. However, everyone was super into it, so I was like, "Well, obviously, I got to do that." But my legs were so skinny that it looked like I was walking around in a pair of double XL Depends, not a super cool Britney diaper. So, ugh. File that under just another popularity plan that backfired. I was also always shooting myself in the foot by getting can duty at lunch. Can duty was basically the junior high chain gang and our school's version of detention. If you were late to classes, got caught passing notes, or back talked to a teacher, you were assigned to spend your entire lunch period going around the school grounds and picking up cans. What was worse, to ensure that you really did it, you had to collect at least fifty cans each time. And trust me. Even if my hair looked good that day, and I'd rolled up my sleeves and tied them with the absolute coolest glittery pink ribbon in all of Valencia, no one was going to want to talk to me while I was digging through the trash in search of Dr. Pepper cans. I convinced my dad to help me out by raiding the recycling at his office. So for the entirety of my eighth grade year, he was driving around with a bunch of garbage in the back seat of his car, so I could turn in my requisite cans and still have time. To glad hand my way through lunch hour. Ah, the sacrifices that parents make for their children. Finally, eighth grade graduation rolled around, and as a celebration, my mom let me do two things that had previously been banned in the Rivera household: shave my legs and straighten my hair. Or, to be more precise, my mom did both for me. The day of our graduation ceremony. Convinced that I'd nick the hell out of my knees and bleed to death, she had me sit on the side of the bathtub and lathered up my legs, only from the knee down, of course, and did the shaving for me with a little pink plastic disposable razor. I also got a new outfit, a little orange two-piece with matching sequin top and bottom, and walked across that stage feeling like I was on top of the world. I had straight hair and smooth legs. What the hell could go wrong? High school hell. At first, it seemed that high school was going to live up to my mile-high expectations. My best friend Madison had a boyfriend, and all around me, everybody was getting boyfriends. Inevitably, get a boyfriend was soon added to my nightly to-do lists, and it became my mission. As I'd walk down the halls in between classes, I'd scan the boys' passing faces. Who was going to be my boyfriend? Soon, I had a target. Stuart would be my boyfriend. Stuart and I had barely talked, and I knew practically nothing about him except that he was half white, half black, mixed race, just like me. So, duh! Obviously, this was going to work. Stuart and I could do this. We started to exchange a few more words here and there. He'd come up to my locker during passing period and ask for a piece of gum, and I would give it to him. Then one day, Madison and I walked past him and his friend Alex as we were leaving the quad. "Hey, Naya!" Alex yelled. "He wants you to be his girlfriend." Stuart just stood there. "Okay," I yelled back, and it was Alex who flashed us a thumbs up. Still, though, success. I had a boyfriend. The next day, I walked up to Stuart and got his phone number, figuring that if we were going to be in a relationship, then we'd better start talking on the phone, because that's what boyfriends and girlfriends did in the ninth grade: talked on the phone, a lot. Except Stuart didn't have much to say. Forget that. Stuart didn't have anything to say. I had wanted it to last, but alas, Stuart just didn't seem to be the one. So the next day, I told Alex to tell him that I was dumping him. Alex seemed totally up to the task and asked no questions. Madison couldn't believe that I'd broken up with Stuart, but I felt confident in my decision since I now knew that having a boyfriend wasn't really all it was cracked up to be. I was also certain that I knew what key qualities my future true love would have. He has to be. Successful in some career or working toward it, financially well off, and able to spoil me rotten.
Driving a nice car. No POSs. Handsome. Possibly male model material. Preferably with long hair. Sexy. Funny. Has to be able to laugh with me, not at me. Creative, i.e., music, art, etc. Sensitive, but not gay. Romantic, but not corny. A good kisser. Good in bed. Good at kissing my ass. Able to cook, because I can't. Able to clean, plus not bitch at me for it. Able to travel with me. Spontaneous, responsible. At the same spiritual level as me, wherever I am at that time. Nice to the family. Able to go out to dinner a lot. Able to afford several trips to Rodeo Drive. Nice. Patient, Ugh, especially with me. All or mostly all of these things. Even though I'd changed schools and my love life was looking up, I still wasn't eating. I'd always been thin, but now I was in skin and bones territory. In junior high, when we'd lived in an apartment complex, I'd sneak down to the gym and spend hours on the elliptical machines to burn off the few calories that I'd consumed that day. Now that we were in our own house, I'd do yoga videos in my room or even just secretly jog in place when I thought no one was looking. I'm surprised I didn't wear a hole in my carpet. In PE, while other girls tried to avoid sweating as much as possible, I took every timed mile and game of softball very seriously, not wanting to miss any opportunity for more exercise. I'd come home from school starving and cranky, and hoped that my mom didn't notice. I needn't have worried, because for the most part, she didn't. She had my brother and sister to deal with. Both of whom were still in elementary school, the family was starting to have money problems again. And though she and my dad were back together, they were fighting more than ever, to the point where sometimes I'd have no choice but to round up Michael and Nicola and usher them out the door, talking about how fun it would be for the three of us to go to the park for a while. But by the time I was a sophomore, I started to get the feeling that what had begun as a game had maybe gone too far. One day I was so hungry that I was shaking, and I decided to eat an apple. Instead of eating it, though, I just sat there and held it up to my mouth. Couldn't bring myself to take a bite. It was like the two sides of my brain were competing. One of them telling me to eat it; it's just an apple, and the other telling me, "No, no, no, that'll ruin everything." My parents were starting to clue in, and I also felt like I was losing control. It turns out that routinely denying your body nutrients and being hungry twenty four seven is a great way to bring on a mental freakout. I finally worked up the nerve to tell my dad that I thought I was anorexic, which was a slap in the face to my parents. I don't think that either of them had even known anyone with an eating disorder before, and while they knew it was a big deal, they still had no idea what to do about it. At one point, my mom even said, "Nah, this is some white people shit." When we would all sit down to dinner as a family, I'd go to great pains to hide the food, so that it would still disappear from my plate, even though I hadn't eaten a thing. Our dining table was this big wooden hunk with drawers on one side, which was super convenient for me. When no one was looking, I'd scoop the food into the drawer and quickly shut it again. Usually, I'd come back to get it later and throw it away, but not always. So gross, right? I was like Brittany Murphy's character in Girl Interrupted with the chickens. One day, my mom opened the drawer and found a bunch of rotting mashed potatoes and old chicken breasts that I'd stashed in there, who knows when, and forgotten about. For the obvious reason, she flipped and came screaming into my room. She started wailing on me. I was running from her, and she yelled, "What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? This is sick. This is sick. You need help." I knew I needed help, and she should probably be the one to help me. This only added fuel to the fire of our disintegrating relationship. The war between moms and their teenage daughters is an epic one, fought in households around the world. And in the case between me and my mom, 
We both had enough of our own shit going on that we had a hard time putting ourselves in each other's shoes. My mom has never been a great communicator, and she's also a tough-ass lady. It's one of the qualities I admire most in her. But she does struggle with empathy. She's the last person on earth who's going to feel sorry for you, and at this point in my life, that was all I wanted. It didn't and wasn't going to happen, though, and so on the pages of my journal that weren't filled with calorie-counting lists of everything I'd eaten that day and social climbing plans, I'd scrawl, I hate my mom, over and over. July 3rd, 2001 I hate my mom. She's a bitch. I wish she would love me back the way I love her. If she read this, she would probably beat me up. I hate her. July 22nd, 2001 Journal I don't hate my mom. I just don't like her a lot of the time. At the worst of it, I was five foot four inches tall and weighed 98 pounds. I passed out from dehydration when we had to run a mile in P.E., during which I really pushed myself. I had to be taken to the hospital to get an IV. Since it had already been established that my mom was not well equipped to deal with this, most of it fell on my dad. He picked me up from school and took me to the hospital, and we sat there, mostly in silence, as I got a needle in my arm. Naya, you've got to eat, he'd say. I don't know what else to tell you. You're killing yourself. I'd nod, with tears streaming down my face but then I'd be right back up on my feet after the IV, and the next day I'd throw my lunch in the trash once again. After an additional hospital visit, my dad seemed to realize that something drastic needed to be done, and that he was going to have to be the one to do it. Someone told him he should take me to see a psychiatrist, so he did, but the visits were as useless as I would have expected them to be. November 6, 2001 I can't take this. I'm starving. I just had a freaking breakdown because I couldn't even eat an apple. I don't want to tell anyone because they'll just think it's old and be annoyed. I don't have a problem. I just suppress my hunger. I can't stop thinking about it. It's driving me crazy. All I think about is what I've eaten today and what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Dad would come and pick me up after school and then drive me to the psychiatrist's totally depressing and incredibly sterile-looking office. I'd sit on the couch and get asked a bunch of predictable questions. He'd ask me over and over again why I'd felt the need to do this, a question that I could readily answer. Not eating made me feel in control. I'd already self-diagnosed. I knew why I did this. If the guy had been worth his copay, he probably would have realized that it was my control issues that needed to be addressed here, and that by working on them, the eating disorder would probably resolve itself. Instead, he decided that I must be depressed, and prescribed Lexapro, an antidepressant. My parents aren't pill-popping people, so I think under normal circumstances, they would have balked at putting their teenage daughter on psychotropics. But at this point... They were at their wit's end and willing to try anything that an expert told them would work. I've never dealt with anything like this before, my mom would say. I wish I knew how to help you. I was prescribed a very small dosage, but still, taking the pills made me feel weird, like I was two steps removed from everything around me. I hated feeling out of it, so I secretly started to throw the pills away while pretending to take them. I knew that something was wrong with me, but I also knew I wasn't depressed. Finally, I told my parents that I wanted to stop taking the pills, which really meant that I was ready to stop having to pretend that I was taking the pills. There was an unspoken understanding among the three of us that since I had gotten myself into this, I would somehow know how to get myself out. And I did. Toward the end of my sophomore year of high school, I became friends with a group of black girls at school who unlike the white girls I knew who considered a slim fast bar to be a meal, had no desire to be skin and bones. They preached to me about how guys like thick girls with asses and curves. Since at this point in my life my only guy experience was my 12-hour relationship with Stuart, I decided that I should probably try to get another boyfriend. 
These girls were friends with a bunch of jocks, and since there were a couple of guys on the football team I wouldn't mind making out with, that, amazingly enough, was all it took to get me to start eating again. Soon, instead of agonizing over an apple, I was going through the McDonald's drive through twice a day. I gained 15 pounds and never looked back. The Big One Eight and Making Big Decisions My child acting money had gone into something called a Coogan account, which is kind of like an official trust set up to make sure that your parents don't steal all your money. More on this later. You get access to it when you turn 18, and a good portion of my high school years was spent dreaming about what I'd do as soon as I got access to my account. I knew exactly what I was going to do with part of it, at least. I'd always been made fun of for being flat-chested, but as long as I was really skinny, barely their boobs were part of the package. As soon as I got thick, though, I wanted T-I-T-S. My dad's colleague was married to this diminutive Dominican trophy wife, Erica, who was super cute, fun to be around, and the proud owner of some amazing-looking fake tits. Erica was extra nice to me and took my awkward teenage self under her wing. The first time I ever ate pop brownies was at her house, because she seemed to always be cooking up a batch and let me try one. She shopped almost exclusively at Barney's and designer boutiques, and the first time I ever went shopping on Rodeo Drive, she was the one who took me. I felt very pretty woman, except without the prostitution. Her uniform was always sassy little bodycon dresses, even though she'd had two kids, and that made her even more of a superwoman in my eyes. I'd babysit her kids whenever she needed me to, and she paid me really well, and even let me raid her closet. She had tons of velour Juicy Couture sweatsuits, which were the absolute apex of L.A. fashion in 2004. So I'd borrow those and even spritz myself with her perfume, total stalker style. She had already had breast implants, but when she got them done for the second time, I helped out and watched the kids while she was recovering from the surgery. When she came back, she showed me her new toys. Wow, I said, those are fantastic. When I turn 18, I am totally getting my boobs done. Without missing a beat, she handed me a business card and said, See him. So I did. When I became a legal adult, I came complete with a plastic surgeon. As soon as I got access to my Coogan account, I made an appointment for a consultation. I had already told my parents about my plans, but they were, no surprise, staunchly opposed to the idea. I asked my mom to come with me, and in protest she said no. I do not condone this, she said icily sitting at the kitchen table with her back to me. I was completely undeterred and just drove myself to the appointment. At the doctor's, I told them when my birthday was and when I wanted to schedule the appointment, and then I wrote a check for the $8,000 procedure so it was paid for before I even walked out the door. When it came time to have the surgery, I took a week off school. I went around to all my teachers, told them I was going to be out, and gathered up all the assignments that I was going to miss. Where are you going? Many of them asked, assuming that I was headed off on a family vacation to Hawaii or something of the sort. I'm getting plastic surgery, I'd tell them gleefully, then head right back out the door. My art teacher was stoked, though, when I told her. She said that she, too, had fake tits and that she was very excited for me. I can't wait to see what they look like when you come back, she said, which under many other circumstances could be interpreted as totally creepy. The day of the procedure, my dad decided to drive me. I was living with him at the time, and as much as I don't think he liked the idea, he also knew that letting his teenage daughter drive herself to and from surgery was a guaranteed way to win him the Worst Parent Award. I was dressed for the occasion, wearing a hot pink, juicy couture sweatsuit, Ugg boots, and a Tiffany Hart locket necklace. I'm pretty sure this is the official Getting Fake Tits outfit as designated by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. I was not scared one bit about going under or about how painful the recovery process might be. And after the surgery, I didn't hurt much at all, and I didn't even need to take the painkillers they'd given me. Back home at my dad's, I was up and walking around until he convinced me I should probably take a pain pill and go to bed, because staying up all night after surgery, as though nothing had happened, was probably not a good idea. Madison was the first person to visit. 
She came over to see them and brought me Jamba Juice. My mom eventually came around to my new boobs as well. She had to admit that they looked pretty great, and she started to help me shower and change my bandages, both of which were hard to do on my own. For a while, I had restrictions on what I could do. I couldn't lift anything heavy or raise my arms above my head, and I had to make sure to massage the implants against a wall so they wouldn't get hard. This looked as awkward and as weird as you might imagine, kind of like a cat rubbing up against a pole. My new boobs were a confidence thing, not a sexual thing. I'd never even taken my top off for a guy. I hadn't had many opportunities to do so, but even if I had, it probably wouldn't have happened because my bra was always stuffed with napkins or, if I'd managed to sneak them, my mom's chicken cutlets. Even after I got my implants, it was still a long time before anyone but Madison and my mom saw them. Not that the boys didn't try. As soon as I went back to school, they were all extra nice and practically fell over themselves rushing to see who could hold the door open for me. When I went to see my art teacher, she was super impressed. Do you mind if I ask? She said. Who did these? So I pulled a business card out of my backpack, handed it to her, and said, See him. Calling a truce with my body image. Thankfully, more than a decade after all this stuff happened, I'm happy to say that I no longer treat my body like it's my enemy. Now I love to cook for myself and my family, and since I know how bad fast food is for you, even when it tastes good, you won't find me cruising around town with a Big Mac in my hand. If I went to McDonald's twice in one day now, I'd probably puke. I have a healthy relationship with food now. I can still lose weight easily, like if I need to quickly drop a pound or two for a photo shoot or shed my post-baby bulges, but I do it the right way. I might as well make bumper stickers that say, Starvation is not the answer. I still consider myself something of a control freak, though. It's just how I am. I will never be a go-with-the-flow kind of girl, bouncing around like a pinball. I like to know where I'm going, and that I'm in the driver's seat. I want to have my fall wardrobe sorted out by the beginning of the summer. I know how I want my house to look. And when I have a schedule, I like to stick to it. I think this is also part of why I have such a strong work ethic. I always know my lines, I'm always on my mark, and I'm always on time. I take pride in being professional, and I like to set a goal and work toward it. As a teenager, though, you have very few outlets where you can decide what you want for yourself. You probably don't have a job, you can't drive yourself, and you're at this weird transition point when the only way you can have any independence is if someone else decides to give it to you. Controlling what I ate was my one way out the place where I felt like I got to make the decisions in my life. In my journal, I'd note what I'd eaten that day and what I planned to eat tomorrow. Keeping track and organizing what I ate and the effort it took to hide what I was doing felt like a full-time job, which was actually exactly what I wanted. I wasn't acting at all anymore, and I needed to have something that felt like work. I don't want to trash the idea of going to therapy or taking medication because that is what works for some people, and both can be very valuable tools. It just wasn't what worked for me at that point in my life. Now I go to therapy semi-annually because I think it's a much-needed time out. It helps me to be more introspective, to be more grateful, and to get to know myself in ways that can hopefully make me a better person. My mom is also now my best friend. I've even read her my horrible journal entries, which now come off as laughable odes to teenage angst and melodrama. I still wish she had been more understanding of what I was going through, and I think she does too, but we both understand why she wasn't. I think you're finally an adult when you can look at your parents as people going through their own shit, rather than just seeing them as unfeeling tyrants here to make your life miserable. It also seems like body issues are the norm for a lot of women, and I'm sure more than a few people will read these pages and think, that's me. Being happy with how we look is just something that a lot of us struggle with, and we can name what we hate much more easily than we can name what we love. Some of our parts are too skinny, some are too fat, and some we just hate for no reason. 
We're always super critical of ourselves, and that leads us to be more critical of other people as well. You see it in all the tabloids that seem to be chomping at the bit to get a pic of someone bending over in a bikini on the beach, just so they can draw a big red circle around the cellulite. So what? We're supposed to make ourselves feel better by making other people feel worse? It doesn't work that way. Accepting your body is a lot easier said than done, which is why I think you got to do what you got to do to make yourself feel good. People have a lot of opinions about plastic surgery, but more than ten years after I got my boobs, they still make me happy when I look in the mirror. It might have even been the best eight k I've ever spent. Sorry, wallowing in self hatred. It's not cute. Starving myself crazy. This did a number on my physical and mental health, and I owe my body a big apology. Stashing my dinner in a drawer rather than eating it, Mom. I am truly sorry you had to discover this decomposing compost heap. Shitty communication. Being better at talking things through would have saved both me and my parents a lot of trouble and tears. Thinking I hated my mom. Moms and teenage daughters will never get along. We just have to realize it's nothing personal on either side. School uniforms, seriously, they're the worst. Can duty and falling victim to the school's indentured servitude recycling program. Not sorry. Keeping a journal and making lists. I learned early on that writing down your goals is the first step toward achieving them. Boob job. I thank my Coogan for this cleavage. Knowing myself well enough to know that I didn't need antidepressants. Learning to love my body and take care of it, even if I don't think it's perfect. Figuring out ways to get around can duty. Thanks, Dad.